I'm happy to welcome everyone at the first online event of the um, Yiddishland Pavilion. Yiddishland Pavilion um, is the first um, transnational um, online and offline uh, project, the Pavilion, that's um, taking part at the Venice Biennale and represents um, Yiddishland uh, at the Venice Biennale. It's an imaginary country, land, a space, territory. It's a stateless network connected through the Yiddish language and culture. And for us as uh, curators of the project for Yevgeny Fix and for myself, um, this is a very um, important initiative to also uh, challenge national division at the Venice Biennale um, to understand how transnational projects can be integrated into the fabric of the Biennale. Uh, the Yiddish Land Pavilion is taking place in different places. It takes place um, online. Um, you see my background. This is um, first, um, Thing that you see when you go to our uh, website, yiddishlandpavilion.art. We also have two projects um, at the Venice Biennale. Um, they both are digital, but can be also experienced um, physically. One of them is an audio walk through different pavilions in Jordania and Arsenale. And another project is a digital sculpture that you can uh, experience in the German pavilion. Um, and today we're starting another very important aspect of the project, which is a series of online events with um, artists, scholars, curators, um, people who focus on various um, Jewish and Yiddish narratives. And we are gonna try to look at them from different disciplines, including um, contemporary art, curating, history, architecture, uh, performance, uh, playwriting, script writing, and so on. And today our first uh, speaker is um, Rochel Kefferson. I'm super excited to be welcoming Rochel today, and I would like to ask uh, Yigeni Fix to introduce her to our audience. Thanks so much, uh, Masha. Um, so it's it's great uh, a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and great great Yiddishist Rochel Kafrisen. Uh, Rochel is a journalist and playwright uh, based in New York City. Uh, her twice monthly Rochel's Golden City column covers new Yiddish culture in all its iterations, and her op-eds regularly appear in newspapers all over the world. Um, her, her years as a super title operator on New York's Yiddish theater scene planted the seeds for her most recent bilingual English Yiddish play, Stummer Shabbos, Silent Sabbath, uh, a black comedy about the dangers of ethnography. In the summer of 2021, um, she released a Yiddish translation adaptation of G Jimmy Buffett's why don't we get drunk and screw? Called Kumtsumir, come to Mir. Kumtsumir um, was recorded by an all star Klezmer trio, and the video has now been viewed almost 10,000 times on YouTube. Without further ado, um, Rochel Kaprisen. Thanks, Genia. Thanks, Masha. Um, so thank you for having me at the Yiddish Land Pavilion. This is so cool. And I, I like an intimate audience, you know, um, you really feel like you're connecting with people. Um, so I have prepared a lecture or a talk um, just for today. So this is the first time I'm giving it. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unfurls. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to have a little video, a little audio, some photos, a little trip down memory lane. Um, so while I attempt to share my screen. Okay, there we go. Slideshow. Okay. So mapping the impossible in the capital of modern Yiddish culture, a highly personal and non-exhaustive tour of my Yiddish New York over the last three decades. And this is just gonna be really, it's gonna be a tiny slice, just a tiny slice of life here. Okay, there we go. So what makes New York City the capital of virt virtual Yiddish land? What are the material conditions which have enabled our current golden age of new Yiddish culture? These are the questions that I'm gonna be addressing in, in the next few minutes. So it's not an attempt to 
comprehensively look at every aspect of Yiddish culture in New York City. I just want to think through some of the material conditions as I think this is of great interest to people today, considering how difficult it is to make one's living in New York City. Um, okay, and here's a few photos I put together. Um, these are all places we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Maybe you recognize some of them. So if we have this concept of Yiddishland as a transnational concept, it's a group of people, it's a shared culture, it crosses boundaries, but it doesn't have a country to call its own, um, which is a central theme I know of your Yiddishland pavilion project, right? Um, so I ask, what makes a capital city of a virtual nation? If I'm arguing that New York City is the capital today of Yiddishland, as Warsaw was um, on the eve of World War II, well, we look at things like the high density of the Jewish population. So that means that we have a large pool from which to draw uh, our small slice of artistic and creative class, people who are doing the kind of work that we're talking about the bigger the pool of people you have, uh, the better it is because then you have more, um, more options, you have more people participating. Um, and also a large Jewish population is great for potential audiences and supporters of your new Jewish work. Although of course, if you talk to the artists, they don't wanna, they don't wanna just be speaking to other Jews, of course, and that's understood, but it's kind of, there's always that tension when you do Jewish art, you know, who is your audience and it really helps and you see that in New York at events, it really helps to have a built-in audience. So what else is important? Uh, many and diverse Jewish institutions to provide support and resources for artists and art. So that could be JCCs and synagogues and um, other kinds of like archives, for example. Um, and uh, you also need Yiddish cultural organizations which can provide support to both experts and beginners. And this is probably the most rare um, item on the list because you know it's extremely difficult to find these things and to build them from scratch so many of these or most of them are legacy organizations or um, legacy, legacy institutions uh, you also need jewish institutions and organizations with physical locations because you know we don't want to spend the rest of our lives in the virtual space we want to go back to mixing with other people um, we want to go back to the days where we ran into people at a bar or a club or an art space or uh, Yivo's lobby. Um, you need a robust matrix of non-Jewish clubs, bars and performance spaces. Um, so we'll see a mix in the presentation of both dedicated really, you know, Jewy places and general places. And you need uh, Jewish publications and media to provide advertising, criticism, outreach. In short, what does it take to be the capital of Yiddishland? Lots of Jews, Jewish cult cultural organizations, especially those who own real estate and specialized Yiddish cultural institutions accessible to beginners and experts. We live in what Jeffrey Chandler has called the post vernacular age of Yiddish, which means that for the most part outside of very um, closed off Hasidic communities, Yiddish is no longer a day-to-day spoken language. It doesn't serve the same purposes that it did before the war. So expertise and accessible expertise in Yiddish is all the more crucial for the ability to make new Yiddish culture. This talk will be very brief and we will only be visiting a few of the many interesting spots on the map of Yiddish New York, the capital of Yiddishland. I will not be addressing Hasidic Yiddish culture um, I thought maybe, you know, there would be people already yelling at me, you know, about Hasidim and how we need to talk about Hasidim and I totally agree. So I'm giving you my caveat, I'm not touching that. Um, but, you know, the Hasidic community is responsible for the increase in the number of Yiddish speakers and the average age of, the, of a Yiddish speaker today has actually dropped because they're all babies. <laughs> So, you know, it's a kind of an amazing thing, um, but I'm not, I'm not gonna be addressing that, okay? Miracle of Yiddish New York City, the capital of Yiddishland. Even with the steep decline in native 
native born non Hasidic Yiddish speakers and high barriers to learning Yiddish for adults. And decades of gentrification and unchecked luxury development, limiting affordable real estate for housing, as well as making and presenting art, even with those two huge um, barriers, those, those uh, challenges, New York, uh, new Yiddish culture is constantly being made and reinvented by artists at every level of Yiddish language knowledge. And I'm sort of assuming that everybody who's tuning in understands that. I'm not really going to go into that, but, you know, in the last 30, for really 40 years, you know, we're talking about the Klezmatics and John Zorn and all kinds of stuff going on um, for a really long time. Um, amazing Yiddish culture, radical Jewish culture, um, the knitting factory, which we are going to talk about. Um, but I'm not going to take a lot of time to catalog that because I'm assuming that you guys know that there's a lot and has been a lot of Yiddish culture going on for a really long time. Okay. I'm going to, I'm zigging, maybe perhaps where people thought I might zag, I'm going to zig here a little bit and I'm going to go really specific and I'm going to start by a um, doing sort of a case history. Um, I'm going to begin my virtual walking tour of Yiddish New York with the story of one particular artist. His name is Ty Sitterman. He's a guitarist. He's a really lovely guy. And um, I wrote about his newest CD last year and I interviewed him. And that provided a really, a lot of interesting, um, sort of an interesting narrative of his experience through time and space in New York City uh, that really resonated with me because he and I are the same age and have fall in, lo in love with a lot of the same places, clubs that have closed, clubs that have opened. Um, so I thought it, was, it would be great to use his story to sort of demonstrate or show to you what, where Yid Yiddish New York plays out. So um, I thought it'd be nice actually, if I could play you a little bit of his music. This is a very interesting album. It is, um, beautiful uh, guitar, like delicate guitar work. Uh, Judith Berkson and Sarah Serpa do uh, microtonal singing on it and they're singing um, Yiddish poetry, radical Yiddish poetry of the labor movement of a hundred years ago. Uh, it, it's just like such a beautiful, interesting, challenging project. So I'm gonna actually share my audio for two minutes, we're gonna listen. Um, okay. Okay, um, so that was a little bit from uh, Bob Kabbalah and Voices, and that was the song Esriyatzich, um, It's Moving Ahead. I'm going to go back to my, um, back to my share here. Okay, so there's the cover, and there's Ty and Judith and Sarah. Okay, and um, the, it's pretty obvious what this is. This is the knitting factory um, at its old location. So actually, I jumped a little bit. Let me just say a little bit about Ty. Um, so like I said, he's my age. He grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. However, uh, I grew up on Long Island. He grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and it's kind of a weird place to grow up. Uh, he went to the same, apparently the same WASPI prep school as Vincent Price. Uh, so very white, very non-Jewish. But on the other hand, he grew up with his grandmother who had immigrated as a teenager and was a lifelong Yiddish speaker and reader of Yiddish newspapers. She was from a town near Rovno in Ukraine. So he had that sort of dual experience of really being smack dab in the middle of Midwestern America and also having an old world grand Yiddish speaking grandmother at home. He had always wanted to learn Yiddish, but it was hard to do 
in St. Louis, Missouri at Vincent Price's old prep school. Um, but it became a possibility when he moved to New York City to uh, attend college as an undergraduate. After he graduated, he was in his 20s, he was living in New York City and working as a musician. At that point, he had a band called Gut Bucket, which some of you might have heard of. And he was embedded in the late 1990s downtown knitting factory scene. So here's this picture. This is the old knitting factory um, at um, 47 East Houston Street. And uh, that was where he first heard the Clasmatics at the knitting factory. The Clasmatics were very, very much associated with the knitting factory for many, many years. This is actually where I also saw the Clasmatics for the first time. When I was in high school, I convinced my mom to take me into the city because <laughs> I had read about it in the New Yorker. <laughs> so I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. I mean, wow. Um, and at the end of the show, uh, John Zorn, the saxophone player, you know, and the John Zorn, whose record label is Tzaddik, and, you know, he created this radical Jewish culture label. He jumped on the stage at the end, and I was so angry because I had been grooving with the Clasmatics. I was there to see them. And then this guy comes up, and he just starts squawking away on his saxophone. And I thought, oh, who is that jerk off? Get him off the stage. Don't tell him I said that. Anyway, the old bidding factory was a death trap. I was actually terrified. And I don't, you know, I was not a cautious kid, but it was very scary. So um, it eventually moved, thank God. All right, around that same time, so Ty is a young guitarist, is he's establishing his name as a musician in the downtown scene. The Knitting Factory is really like a hot place. It's very important. Plasmatics are there. Um, so Ty decides that it's time to take a Yiddish class. Well, when it's time to take a Yiddish class, it's, um, what would we say, the late 1990s, early 2000s, where do you go? I could not find a picture of the exterior of the old work and circle building, which is which was on 45 East 33rd Street. So I just took a screenshot of the map here. And I think it's appropriate. The Workman Circle Cemetery Department, which was actually, <laughs> I worked in that building for a while in the late 90s. And the cemetery department was uh, hopping. I mean, it ironically, it was one of the most important uh, departments there because many, many people had bought their funeral plots through them. Um, okay, so he, but that was the, the point is that if you wanted to take a Yiddish class at that time, basically your choices were to go to Yivo or to go to the Workman's Circle. Um, so he went to the Workman's Circle, but when you went to that building on 45 East 33rd Street, it wasn't just one thing, it was many things. Okay, so there, um, uh, it was this huge building in Midtown. It housed many interrelated Yiddish organizations. It offered Yiddish classes on site. It had an on-site bookstore offering Yiddish books and CDs, which were virtually impossible to get elsewhere. And it employed many Yiddish cultural workers and artists. So it was it could be a day job for people who were doing other things for artists. So um, Ty had as his first Yiddish teacher, Pesach Fishman. And Pesach Fishman was also one of my first Yiddish teachers. And he was absolutely a delightful person. He had been born in Argentina and moved to New York City and uh, was absolutely a character and a wonderful teacher. And everybody who had him, you know, loved him and misses him. Now, um, the Arbiter Ring, which means worker circle, workman circle, had at one time been part of this gigantic sort of whole network of Yiddish organizations. It was part of the Forward Association. So you had the Forverts, which at one time was like a, had a massive circulation all over the country. So you had the Forward, the Forward Association, which was the umbrella. And under that, you had uh, the Arbiter Ring, which was a uh, membership organization that offered benefits and insurance and things like that, but there were so many other things. Um, you, when you walked in that building, even when you walked into 45 East 33rd Street, you got the sense like you were in another world, you were walking into a complete Yiddish world. It was considerably diminished and you got that feeling. It was not what it once had been, but it was still chugging away. And it was kind of amazing as a young person to walk in there and find it, this sort of out of place, you know, like um, if you've ever seen like the Lost World, you know, or King Kong, <clears throat> where they go to the island and they discover all the dinosaurs are still alive. And that was kind of the feeling, <clears throat> but wonderful, wonderful Yiddish dinosaurs. Um, you would walk in there and there was uh, uh, folk shula, you know, so if you wanted to, you didn't want to send your kids to Hebrew school, you could send them to the Arbiter Ring. 
Um, they had summer camp. There was the Yiddish theater, had their office there, the Volksbühne, and that's where I worked when I worked in that building. The Forward's newspaper offices were in this building at 45 East 33rd in the bookstore. It was in that bookstore in the Arbeitering uh, building that Ty bought his first klezmatic CD, which was Possessed. Um, if you'll recall, this was in the late 90s, Tony Kushner wrote the playwright, he wrote his own version of the Dybbuk and the Klezmatics did the music for it. And it's really fabulous um, on it. Uh, Michael Wex wrote a song in Yiddish about smoking pot, which is absolutely fantastic. So you should get possessed if you don't own it. And as Ty said to me, if you can wear a CD thin from repeat playings, he did that playing his, um, his CD of the Klezmatics Possessed. Now, um, in addition to the Knitting Factory, which was very important to him as a late 1990s, early 2000s musician on the downtown scene, where did you go? You went to the Knitting Factory and you also went to Tonic. So Tonic was this tiny little place, as you see here. I mean, it was like, it was like nothing, it was a clinicite. You know, you, you would walk by and not think that there was anything to, you know, remarkable about it. Um, but inside, again, you know, you had this tiny little performance space. There was a, um, a like a refreshment bar, like you could get food along here. And there was a bathroom that always seemed to be out of order and was horrible things happened in that bathroom. So this was at, oh my God. Gotta turn that off. I don't know if you can. Okay, sorry, that's, that was really horrible. Um, okay, sorry, uh, I'm just gonna tell my brother to stop calling me. <laughs> Okay, so um, Norfolk Street, 107 Norfolk Street was the heart of the old Lower East Side and it was the, formerly it had been the Kedem Kosher Winery, which, you know, had been around for a hundred years and had been converted into this uh, artist-centered performance venue. And artist-centered means, first of all, that oftentimes artists themselves would be curating um, who would be appearing there, but also it was a place that musicians themselves wanted to be in the audience. Um, and oh, also noted by me as the home of the Sunday Bagel Brunch, um, which is, uh, <laughs> I was very excited to go to the Klezmer Bagel Brunch on many Sundays when I should have been at my law school um, study group, but instead I was at Tonic hanging out and uh, looking for boys. So, um, okay, oh, so, uh, Ty told me that um, one of his really formative experiences happened at Tonic, which was that he had gone to see uh, Fred Frith, who was a, is a guitarist, who was supposed to be appearing, I think, with somebody else, and that person got sick. So Fred was appearing solo, just a solo guitar, and Ty was in the audience, and he said that seeing that solo guitar performance totally changed the way he conceived of what a solo guitar performance could be, and he himself, Ty, is a guitarist. So that's really a big deal, you know, when you have those kind of experiences. And that was what could happen at a place like Tonic, which was so small and so intimate and had such a great, you know, Hamish vibe. Um, I hate it when people call everything uh, Hamish, but like, it really was. Okay, so Tonic and another club that was sort of like that, the Stone, were places where that could happen. So as Ty developed his identity as a musician, he kept feeling the pull back to Yiddish. <clears throat> but at the same time, now he was uh, not only working as a, a, a guitarist, like in clubs and on gigs, but he was getting jobs playing accompaniment in American style synagogues. And it just happened that at one of those jobs during Rosh Hashanah, he met uh, the guitarist Mark Ribot. So Mark Ribot is a very well-known jazz avant-garde sort of category busting guitarist who is also very much associated with this downtown scene. And he's a generation older than us. Um, uh, Mark Ribot is also a collaborator with John Zorn. So, um, you know, he was having these experiences being embedded downtown at Tonic at, uh, uh, um, 
at the knitting factory and he's playing at these syn American synagogues, which are not really resonating. And he said there was a voice of Jewishness in, in there. His, he, was, he kept being pulled towards something much deeper. So um, he said his Yiddish teacher at the Workman Circle, Pesach Fishman, said to him, don't worry about your accent. <laughs> your ancestors will come out when you speak. Um, and he said about Pesach, Ty said that Pesach had a mystical meta-historical approach to language learning, which I loved. And that's so great because that also shows how experiencing a teacher who encourages you and is not judgmental can really push you further in your journey to language learning. Um, you know, especially in the Yiddish world, a lot of people get very discouraged. Uh, there are a lot of there have always been various kinds of gatekeeping and you know, people who will discourage you and tell you you're saying each word wrong. And then the other person will say, no, that person is saying the word wrong. So when you have a teacher like that, it really means a lot. Okay, so around this time, um, we're moving ahead in time. Uh, Ty was spending a lot of time at John Zorn's new music space, which was called The Stone. Um, and The Stone, so this is musicians davening between sets of the stone. This was probably, I'm, I don't quite remember, but I think this was probably uh, when Zion 80 was playing one of their banana shows. It was like a million musicians. It was like huge horn section. I think lost, I lost like half of my hearing during one of those shows and I didn't care because it was so great. Um, Zion 80 is uh, John Madoff's band. Um, it's incredible. You got to see it live. Okay. So um, he was spending a lot of time at the Stone. John Zorn had taken his MacArthur money and opened this tiny little club um, at uh, Avenue C and 2nd Street. And um, oh, yeah. So at a Zion 80 show, uh, John invited both Ty and Frank London to play. Frank is the trumpeter for the Cosmetics. They played together and that was the first time they'd played together. And that brings me to my next point, which is the importance of shared public and domestic spaces to ferment new culture, chance meetings and staying out too late. Um, so it was at a different show at the Stone um, that he saw Frank again. Frank was playing with his Cosmo Brass All-Stars and he brought on another collaborator, Sarah Gordon, uh, who is a Yiddish singer among other things. And um, afterwards, people hung out and Frank's place is just a couple blocks away. And they all went, a bunch of musicians, they went to Frank's and, and they ended up talking for a long time. And so Ty, who's just kind of starting out on his Yiddish journey, he ends up talking to Sarah Gordon. And Sarah is the daughter of Adrian Cooper, who um, was working at the Workman's Circle um, and is herself a very important figure in Yiddish culture in New York. So Ty ends up meeting Sarah and they end up talking about Yiddish poetry and that begins a fruitful collaboration with Sarah introducing Ty to a number of different poems and he's thinking about making this album, he's going to make an album for John Zorn. They start talking about poetry and she lends him a bunch of collections of Yiddish poetry and that, that's sort of ongoing and that only happened because they ended up hanging out after the show. Um, and he knew he wanted to work with Judith Berkson and I'll skip some of the steps around there. Um, but in New York, these kind of serendipitous meetings happen quite a bit. If you go out, you meet people and clubs are small. You end up talking to people and this person will introduce you to that person and that matters. That's how new partnerships are forged, new networks. Okay, so now we're going to talk about a really big anchor in Yiddishland, in the capital of Yiddishland, the anchor that really makes all of this possible. This is the Center for Jewish History at 15 East 16th Street. This is a world away west of um, the stone. Um, and it's actually right by Union Square. And inside the Center for Jewish History is uh, EVO, but also the Leo Beck Institute, uh, the Sephardic Federation, um, the American Jewish Historical Society and a number of other organizations. And they've only been in this space, I think maybe a little bit over 15 years. Um, so YIVO has, since it arrived in New York, it's been in a number of different places. Um, it's been all over the place, but I, hopefully it will stay here, um, which is a wonderful location. It's a wonderful building. 
And so Ty was going to, he'd been asked by John Zorn to create an album uh, for his Sadek label for this radical Jewish culture project. And um, so he was pursuing these threads of Yiddish poetry and he wanted to uh, get some songs and some inspiration. Well, you know, what do you do? You walk down to Yibo and you make an appointment with the sound archive. And he said that he spent hours in the sound archive working with two of its archivists, Eleanor Bozinski and Lauren Slamberg, both of whom are uh, incredibly accomplished musicians um, themselves. Lauren, of course, is uh, one of the co-founders of the Klezmatics. And Eleanor has multiple projects. Um, she's a wonderful klezmo fiddler as well as a Yiddish singer. Um, so the, the product of all of that work, of all those years of journey, let's say, of him sort of moving around these different nodes of Yiddish life in New York, both informal and formal, right? You have the clubs, you have the intimate hangs at somebody's apartment. You also have the institutional meetings, right? At Evo and the sound archive where people help each other and they do research and the product can be uh, you know, a beautiful, challenging, interesting um, project like this of settings of old Yiddish poetry by someone who is not a Yiddishist. He's not a fluent Yiddish speaker, but it, he is someone who is very serious about Yiddish, let's say. So um, I just, this is just a little uh, snapshot of the liner notes here. Okay. Um, So from one perspective, if we review our journey around the capital so far, it's kind of depressing in a way. The stone is gone, tonic is gone, the Workman Circle with its conveniently located classrooms and bookstore, that building is gone. So, you know, tonic is now luxury condos and the Workman Circle building on East 33rd Street is now a luxury hotel. Um, I've been here since 1997 and as long as I've been in New York, the pace of change has only ever increased. What makes New York City so special is its historic character, especially the Jewish institutions scattered all over the city. And yet there's no guarantee anything will be where it was last week, especially in a fast changing neighborhood such as the Lower East Side in East Village. Um, okay, so here we can have, this is the Lower East Side. This is uh, East Broadway, and this is the Forbrooks building. And you can see it says four words there across the top. I believe um, they had some like really incredible uh, like uh, bas relief. Oh, it says forward there. I think there's a uh, Karl Marx, Marx and Engels are uh, carved on the building. Well, guess what this building is now? Luxury condos. <laughs> um, uh, but at the time, East Broadway was a center of Yiddish publishing and Yiddish newspapers. Uh, it was right down the street from another very important Yiddish newspaper called The Tug. That was at 185 East Broadway. Um, however, the dynamic of urban change can go in surprising directions. Who would have guessed that the old Kedem kosher wine factory would turn into one of the hippest clubs for a few brief consequential years? So we're going to go down a few blocks a few blocks down from Tonic's old home at 107 Norfolk Street to 172 Norfolk Street, okay? This is the former Slunimer Synagogue. Um, the, there have been a number of different congregations that were here, but between 1921 and 74, it was the Slunimer. Um, and just for, if anybody doesn't know, Slunimer means that it is, it was founded by um, immigrants from Slonim, who, which was in Poland at that point but is now in Belarus. Um, okay. So by 1974, the neighborhood was not what it once was. People were leaving. The whole neighborhood was experiencing a real um, downward turn and it became abandoned. This building, this beautiful building was abandoned. In the 80s, it was bought by a Spanish Jewish artist named Angel Orensands and it was turned into an art gallery, performance space and event hall. So next, I wanna play you a clip of a concert that happened in September, 2007, Rosh Hashanah, a few, just a few months after the heartbreaking closure of Tonic, okay? We're just gonna to listen to two minutes. 
Okay, this is a really great clip and I'm not gonna play it for you now, but you should go find it and listen to the whole thing. I wanted to, <clears throat> you to see the transition between the um, reference or the invocation of the golden age of Chazonis, which is he was performing part of the um, Rosh Hashanah liturgy. And then it goes into an original composition that he wrote for his band. So this is Jeremiah Lockwood and the Sway Machinery. And Jeremiah does a number of different really interesting musical projects blues guitar, but also um, Golden Age Chazonis explorations, as well as Yiddish song. So the reason why I wanted to bring you to this particular place was because this was happening right at the same time that Tonic closed, but um, it was actually a kind of different story, right? You had Jeremiah bringing his band to the Angel Oren Sands, which was a revitalized space where Jewish art could flourish again, and the Slonimer Synagogue was the place where his grandfather, the cantor Jacob Konigsberg, had made his cantorial debut in New York in 1949. So it was a kind of unusual story of continuity, you know, sort of by a little bit of a convoluted path, but it was there and, he, and Jeremiah was reclaiming that in a very, very interesting way. Now that story is pretty unusual and far more people working in the capital of Yiddish land today are going to have a story much more like Ty Sitterman's, which is that he spent many, many years following a very delicate thread, often from great distances in order to do the work that he was doing. However, not every story here ends in luxury condos and tears, okay? Do I have a couple more minutes to get into aesthetics? Great, okay. Part two, the aesthetics of Yiddish New York or a peek inside the meeting rooms and function halls of the capital of Yiddish land. I'm gonna get in trouble for this. Okay, so here we have what I would consider, you know, part of the real golden age of um, Yiddish land aesthetics, right? So the Forverts, they built this building in 1912. They were really at the peak of their gain, right? The, the Forverts was um, founded in 1897. So they had already been around for quite a while and their circulation was, you know, amazing. Um, Ab Khan, the editor, was kind of a, you know, marketing genius. And um, so they built this beautiful custom-built building with all this, you know, their marks and angles, sculptures, and uh, lots of room for all their associated organizations. And, you know, it was, it reflected both the age, um, you know, the, the time that they were in, but also it, it reflected their pride in, their mission, they saw themselves as, you know, it, it wasn't just a business, the Forverts had a set of socialist ideals, and, you know, anti-Bolshevik, let's say, you know, but pro, uh, pro-socialism. Okay, well, let's all get into their politics, it's complicated. Um, 
but it shows you that, um, <laughs> that if you can go back in time, the single most important thing you can do after killing baby Hitler is to buy New York real estate. <laughs> Because the Forward Association owning that building, they own WEVD, which was a radio station license. Those things allowed them to survive downturns that destroyed other organizations, that put other organizations out of business. So they, you know, had th these these pieces of capital essentially that they could could liquidate to continue going. Okay. So in 1974, the Forward sold their building and moved uptown into Midtown where they bought another building. It had to be big enough to hold all the components which fell under the Forward Association umbrella. Uh, they purchased a large, very ugly, but functional building in Midtown to be a home to the many Yiddish organizations. Um, oops. So um, the new building had classrooms, meeting rooms, makeshift concert and performance space. Now, was it pretty? Well, so this is a couple pictures from a 2006 um, conference that happened. And uh, you, some of you probably know Soy Korolenko, right? Yeah, he's a fabulous, um, musician, philosopher, linguist. Uh, he performs in many languages and it's too much to get into who Soy is, but um, he's wonderful. And uh, so there he is, this is in 2006. There's Adrian Cooper, who I mentioned before, she was working. Um, she was a full-time employee at the Workman Circle at this time. She, before that she'd been employed by Yivo. She was also an incredible singer uh, and just community, community leader. So I, I chose these pictures because I wanted you to sort of pay attention to the aesthetics of the things here, right? You have this very sort of plain uh, room with this ugly, you know, paint job, um, you know, ugly furniture, but you have this wall of photos and, um, you know, it turns out that this is a very um, distinctive characteristic of the aesthetics of these kind of organizations. Uh, and you can find the, this wall of heroes, the wall of um, tours, as we say in Yiddish, a tour is somebody who does things, right? And there might even be different walls with theater artists or musicians or labor leaders, depending on the organization, okay? Um, and if we had more time, maybe we'd go through who these people are, but um, it's very interesting, right? So that even if you had this kind of ugly, functional, um, you know, plain as could be room, you can still bring some dignity and history to it by creating these, these photo walls. Okay, so again, this is the same uh, conference. It was Jews, Art and Activism. And, and this was um, downstairs on the first floor, there was like a, a meeting hall where you could have like concerts and functions and stuff. And again, like I chose this because I wanted you to see just how kind of the construction is just ugly. I'm sorry, it's very ugly. And here, this is Lieber Kotz, who was so dear. I loved him. We were on the Jewish Currents editorial board together. He was, he grew up in Moscow. His father was like an old school Yiddish communist. He, uh, um, his father was the journalist Moshe Kotz. Anyway, boy, this guy was a character. Um, I think he was about to give an award to his son. And then uh, here's Julia Eisenberg of Blessed Memory. Uh, and she was brought to perform with her colleague, Marika Hughes. Um, they were, they formed a charming hostess if that rings any bells. So, um, you know, you had really great stuff happening, right? You had this incredible link to history, like deep Yiddish history, deep socialist history, communist history. You had radical Jewish music happening here. I mean, this is like cutting edge stuff, right? In the, in the ugliest space, the, the spaces that did not really nurture or cultivate these kind of feelings. And yet it happened anyway. Um, so we have what I call here the zero point aesthetic when legacy Yiddish organizations sell their original homes and trade it in for functionality. You know, that's tachlis. Tachlis is, you know, brass tacks, like that's reality. So here's another, um, uh, example, just like the Workman Circle was an umbrella organization, it was a building with a lot of different uh, Yiddish organizations in it, Atran House on East 21st Street was actually similar to that on a much smaller scale. So uh, in the Atran House building on East 21st Street, uh, you had the Congress for Jewish Culture, you had Tsiko, which was is the bookstore, 
Um, you had the Bund office, the Jewish Labor Com uh, Committee, uh, a bunch of them. And um, so my friend Shane Baker at that time and still is and was the uh, executive director of the Congress for Jewish Culture. Um, and everything that was gone from there by 2013. But this is uh, one, so this was the meeting hall, right? Um, and there's, it's a Gottesman, some of you know him, he's a Yiddish activist. And here's another point of view. Uh, again, we have the, you know, this is a very important part of the aesthetic, right? It could be as ugly as can be, but if you have that visual link to history, you know where you are, right? Uh, and I think that this is, maybe this is Purim, I, that might be Michael Winograd. It's quite possibly Michael Winograd. Uh, there's Sarah Gordon, so yeah, quite possibly. Okay, now we're going to contrast the zero point aesthetic of the Arbiter Ring and the Atran House with what had been and what could have been if all of these organizations had been able to hold on to their original real estate with all the details and the charm and the Hamish kites. Okay, I present to you, this is what's gonna get me in trouble. Uh, so this is the Hebrew Actors Union, which still stands on East 7th Street and has got to be over a hundred years old. The Hebrew Actors Union was really the Yiddish Actors Union. It was the first actors union in the United States. So it has incredible history. Um, and uh, it had this really wonderful, charming, sort of long, uh, tall uh, townhouse on East 7th Street. And again, we have the wall of heroes, the, the, the photos. Um, we see them over here. We're gonna see more of these. You have the banner. Um, oftentimes banners too would be important uh, pieces of decoration in these places because there were often parades, people were marching. They would have, you know, carry their banner for their union or their Verein or their uh, Landsmannschaft or whatever it was. So um, there was a period, and I think this was also 2006, 2007, um, where there were cultural events happening sort of under the radar. It wasn't really official. It wasn't really allowed, but people were doing stuff here because it was such a great space. So for example, somebody had a birthday party here and you can see um, the band is just, it's an incredible band, super hot. We've got Michael Winograd on clarinet. Uh, Dan Kahn was in from Berlin. He sang. Um, Sarah Gordon, um, who I mentioned before, she sang with Frank London. She's singing here. And there's dancing, that's Matt Temkin on the poik. Okay, this is Boris Sandler, who uh, at that time was the editor of the Forverts. He's originally from Moldova and uh, he's standing in front of this portrait of uh, anybody who goes to these places would know who these people are. So this is uh, Yudlamid Peretz with his big, you know, walrus mustache and there's Boris. Um, there's Sarah again. Uh, so I mentioned that she's the daughter of Adrian Cooper. This is um, Jake Shulman Ment, who is an incredible uh, klezmer fiddler. That's Pesach uh, Borstein, who is the father of Mike Borstein, who's a very well-known actor. If you saw the uh, Israeli show Yuda, um, he plays the rabbi on that. Um, Pesach Borstein's son plays the rabbi on that. Okay. Um, so speaking of continuities, this was 2006. Years later. Elinor Buzunski would become a sound archivist at Evo, and Asia Weissman would become the director of the Yiddish Language Institute at the Yiddish Book Center. These are all just people who were at this birthday party. Um, this is Bela Schechter Gottesman of Blessed Memory, and her, her son is Itzik Gottesman, um, who is a Yiddish writer and folklorist, and she's a wonderful, she was a wonderful poet um, and cultural activist from Chernovitz. And here she is talking at that birthday party in front of this wall of cultural activists at the Hebrew Actors Union. Oop, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. So, I'm gonna end it there since I've already gone long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much for this uh, very um, intricate mapping of um, Yiddish um, creative life in, in New York. Um, I have a few questions, but we also have um, a question from the audience, so ask my questions later. So a question from Simon, um, Simon Abrams. He's asking, do you think that the decline of the uh, New York City Alt Weekly newspaper has contributed or maybe just coincided uh, at all with the seeming shrinkage of Yiddish land friendly spaces here? It's a 
coincidence. I mean, it's, you know, look, that we're all victims of the same forces, the same economic forces, unfortunately. Um, just like alt media has collapsed, Jewish media has collapsed at the same time. It's been incredibly difficult for Jewish media to stay afloat. So, I mean, they're, they're certainly on the same sinking lifeboat, I would say. <laughs> Any other questions or, or comments? Oh, we have a comment. So Shane Baker says, yes, that was when a grad who was sitting in the audience when we looked at the photo of the um, Congress the, at, at the Atran House. You know, one of the interesting things talking about how physical spaces are so important for things, you know, is to introduce people who wouldn't necessarily meet. So there were a number of nights when, you know, Shane set up these wonderful Kava Kavahoy's evenings at the Congress and, you know, their general clientele was very serious. It was a sort of very old fashioned or old school kind of Yiddishist that, you know, was very serious, didn't like a lot of vulgarity or, you know, things that were too funny. <laughs> Um, so, you know, Shane at, at certain times would bring in uh, young musicians or uh, just young performers, and sometimes the audience was a little bit confused as to what to do with that. Um, one time Michael Winograd brought his project, it was he and Sarah Gordon were doing heavy metal versions of Yiddish folk songs called Yiddish Princess, which is like one of my favorite Yiddish bands, it's so good. But I remember seeing it for the first time at the Congress with this, you know, room full of like mostly elderly Yiddish speaking Jews and they, you know, Wittergrad pounding on the synthesizer and, you know, Sarah belting it out and them just not understanding what hair metal is or anything. But, you know, it's good for, for different kinds of people to come into contact. And that's another thing that I really love about Yiddishland in New York is that oftentimes you have to be with people that you don't have anything in common with. And in fact, that you may not like, or your politics are very different and that can be very challenging sometimes, but I think that's good. It's something I like. It's not always perfect, but it's, it's good. Um, oh, Shane says it was called the, it was called swinging the secular Seder and people were shocked. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Um, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, in Yiddishland Pavilion, we, of course, talk a lot about um, new um, Yiddish contemporary art, and we talk a lot about visual arts. You've covered mostly performance, poetry, music, and that definitely makes sense. But I was wondering whether you could maybe point to some specific spaces that have been contrib contributing to development of Yiddish visual art uh, that were centers for um, visual artists maybe mm. um, or if you could maybe name a few names that um, you know have popped out during this 30 years well you know it's interesting I'm it's a really good question there are quite a few artists among this you know um, group, this cohort of Yiddishists, like, and, and look at the older generation, Bela was a painter, um, Yonya Fine, who I know that, um, Zhenya, that you're quite interested in his work, so Yonya Fine was also of the same generation as Bela, he was uh, from, um, he was also from Eastern Europe, and um, he was a wonderful painter, I, you know, were there places, were there spaces that that happened? I feel like the painting was often something that happened privately. Um, you would go to somebody's house and see, oh, there, that person is a painter. I didn't know that. Um, although I think that, I, I know for a fact, in the 50s, the Congress, the Cong Congress for Jewish Culture, gave out prizes for both for books, for novels, and for paintings. Um, I had an, an old 1958 issue of the Freie Arbeit der Stimme, which is the anarchist newspaper, and they, I was surprised to come across a whole, you know, column about who had won the Congress premier that year, and visual art was important to that. Um, so it was recognized as a important player, you know, an important component in the, you know, Yiddish cultural world, but where it happened is a question. It's, it's really a question. Like, were those people going to the Art Students League, you know, on 57th Street? Um, maybe, you know, maybe there wasn't a, really a, a quarter where the Yiddish artists might work, like, um, you know, studio on the Lower East, Side, Lower East Side. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. Um, and of, um, a question from 
from Zhenia. Um, I'm thanking you for this brilliant talk. Um, he's asking, as a participant and observer of the last 25 years of Yiddish culture in New York, how do you compare the Yiddish New York of the late 90s to now in 2022? Is there a qualitative and quantitative, quantitative difference? Yeah, there are a lot of differences at a, and, a, and at a lot of levels. I mean, I would say mostly, you know, I kind of feel, I feel old, I am old, you know, when you, you've been around a scene for 20 or 25 years, you know, you wake up one day and you, you're like, oh my God, what? everybody got so young. <laughs> um, and I feel like, you know, there, there's a lot of really good and exciting things to look at today, which is that there are so many young people who are very, feel very empowered. They're coming into Yiddish with a lot of expectations um, and they want to very passionately, they want to connect and they want to do it on their terms. And um, they're much more out about their identities. Um, they're not going to hide their identities, you know, and this is especially around queerness. Um, and there's, you know, a little bit of friction. There's a little bit of tension. Um, but I think that's good and it's productive um, to make, you know, people rethink their assumptions. I mean, the truth is that in the Yiddish world, you know, in the much older generation, a lot of people were closeted, you know, people if they were gay. And I, I can tell you that there were people who I referenced in this, you know, talk who were gay and were never out. You know, maybe people knew, but um, it was not the kind of thing that you really like you didn't bring your same sex partner to the cultural Seder or something. Um, oh, so I wanna share uh, that this is important. So the really exciting news is that, you know, we could talk about the sort of the diminishment of the spaces and how, you know, Atran House disappeared and that's really sad, but the Congress has really exciting news, which is that when it's safe again to assemble people in small spaces, the Congress has this incredible space on 18th street, very accessible. It's a bijou theater and classroom. Um, and it's going to be playing um, Yiddish theater and having classes. So Shane, who is the executive director, and he's going to be arranging what's happening on 18th Street. He says that Atrian, oh, Atrian used to have art shows, especially on when they were on 78th Street. So that was even before the East 21st Street but we had a couple on 25th Street. We also co-sponsored shows of Yoni's art at a couple locations. Yivo certainly has heavy visual components and yeah. So, you know, that's really interesting to me that Atran House used to have art shows. So that meant that there was a physical space uh, for a while. So, uh, and the Congress for Jewish Culture will have art shows in the new 18th Street space once it's safe to have small public spaces open. So, you know, things change, People do things like sell off their, you know, real estate, which is tragic and heartbreaking. But even so, even with all the economic pressures, people are so passionate about Yiddish. It's one of those, you know, cultural spaces where people will do anything to push it forward, you know, and Shane is certainly a great example of that. He works incredibly hard uh, at what he does. And, you know, I think the space on 18th Street, God willing, you know, boo, boo, boo. Um, is going to be really wonderful. Okay. More questions or comments? Um, I, I have maybe one last question. It's not a New Yorker because I believe all of our um, audience today are, are based in New York currently. So uh, in the very beginning of your talk, you spoke of, Yiddish, uh, of New York as a capital for Yiddishland. And I was wondering how you see relations with other places and other important centers of Yiddishland, um, maybe between, let's say, contemporary Warsaw and New York or between some other cities. What are these relationships? Are they changing? Have they changed over these 30 years? And what is this exchange? Is it happening in any in any way? And is it encouraged on, on, on both sides? Hmm. So the relationship between New York and other Yiddish city, other cities with exactly. Yiddish land. or people, or you know, because Yiddish land does this kind of uh, very much of a network circle, right? So people do communicate. Has this communication been changing, or is it like different bubbles, or they're interacting more or less? Yes, it's networks, and I'll tell you the most significant thing that you should look at if you want to answer that question is the network of festivals that have. Um, really come to life in the last 30, 35 years. In my mind, you know, 
for me, the most important one is Class Canada, which happens outside of Montreal, and which means that you have a lot of New Yorkers going to Montreal every year. And sort of, you know, Montreal is so interesting, especially to New Yorkers, because it has this very rooted, you know, very, um, you know, rooted in place Yiddish life, but it's very different and, and has a very different tom, you know, has a different flavor than New York. So it's very interesting. It's very eye opening for New Yorkers to go to Montreal and experience that. And by the way, Class Canada, it's not in Montreal, it's in the mountains, but it, it leads to that kind of exchange. Um, and then of course you have also, I think it's now celebra celebrating 25 years, you have Yiddish Summer Weimar, which is you know um, Germany, uh, which is also very important and leads to cultural exchanges. Um, Paris now, you know they've been having so many amazing programs at the Medem Center. And also a lot of people going back and forth there, um, taking courses. So um, yeah, I feel like the, the festivals and also academic stuff like at Medem, that means it leads to cultural exchanges and people being in both places and having friendships and seeing how other people do things. Uh, that's been really interesting and productive, absolutely, for sure. I hope that the Yiddish Land Pavilion is contributing to this exchange, you know, because we're gathering so many different people um, from very different geographies and from very different fields and in a way kind of, you know, expanding um, um, the territory of Yiddish Land in, non, in, in a wider global world and by stepping into the premises of the Venice Biennale also kind of trying to Yiddishize this, this territory as well. You know what, I see it as being like, you know, we've had these long years of virtual, virtual everything, virtual, you know, the Yiddish world really came forward and went into the virtual space, but I feel like the Yiddish Land Pavilion can be sort of like the um, encapsulation of all those efforts, you know, that to the effort to really give it form and to present it as something other than just, you know, well, this is what we got to do, we got to be virtual, but like, you know, the, this is very exciting. Uh, you know, the way that you guys are conceptualizing it. it. So, you know, that's really cool. To me, it feels like, I hope that this is, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we're also trying to be um, less virtual. You know, we've had a series of events uh, at the um, uh, opening weekend of the Biennale, and we did a few events in um, in Giardini and Arsenal in collaboration with some of the pavilions. So we're trying to be um, virtual, but also think that this physical presence is also very important. Hopefully in two, in two years that will um, enhance it. Um, thank you very much Rahul for this beautiful talk. Uh, I, I find the logic of how you built um, a narrative very interesting and very fresh. It was a real pleasure to, to, to be a part of this conversation. And thank you. It was an honor to be your inaugural event. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. See you, bye. See you in real life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>